When I was twelve years old, John Fry, a worker from our family's farm, came to take me home from school earlier than expected. He brought my own little horse and mentioned that my mother had made delicious treats for us. I was surprised as usually, it was my father who picked me up. John seemed uneasy but didn't explain much. During our journey, we saw a fancy coach with a rich-looking lady, a little girl, and a young boy inside. We also passed through a dangerous area called Exmoor, known for a family of robbers called the Dunes. Despite his advice, I climbed a hill and saw thirty Dune horsemen carrying stolen goods, including a little girl on one of their horses. She wore an expensive dress, and though I couldn't tell if she was okay, seeing her made me upset. When we arrived home, my father didn't come out to greet us, even when the dogs were barking. I hid, not wanting to hear anything. Later, I learned the heartbreaking truth, my father had been killed by the dunes. On his way back from the market, the robbers demanded money from him and the other farmers. While the others complied, my father fought back bravely but was shot. Despite knowing who did it, the local authorities were too afraid or even in league with the Dunes to take action. The Dunes, led by Sir Enser Dune, were once wealthy but lost it all due to a dispute. They settled in Exmoor, where they lived outside the law, growing in number and causing trouble by stealing, taking farmers' daughters, and building their home in Dune Valley. The Dunes began as robbers but soon turned to violence and murder. People were too scared to fight back because the Dunes were strong fighters. Soldiers seemed the only hope to defeat them, so there was no punishment for my father's murderer. After burying him, my mother was left to manage the farm and care for us, me, Annie, and young Lizzie. Though I wanted revenge, my mother calmed me, fearing for my safety and the family's future. We missed my father terribly. I learned to shoot and worked hard on the farm to help my mother. Then, on St. Valentine's Day in 1675 when I was fourteen, I went fishing to find something my mother would eat. I ended up near Dune Valley, not realizing it. I reached a waterfall and, despite its danger, climbed to the top. Exhausted, I was surprised to find a young girl kneeling beside me, touching my face with a leaf. She whispered softly, saying she was glad I was awake and urged me to get better. Her voice was the sweetest I'd ever heard, and her dark, caring eyes fascinated me. She noticed my bleeding feet and offered help, but I pretended I wasn't bothered. I introduced myself as John Ridd, and she revealed she was Lorna Dune, seeming fearful of her name. I tried to comfort her when she cried, assuring her she hadn't done anything wrong. I gave her all the fish I had for my mother and promised to catch more. I impulsively kissed her cheek, feeling embarrassed immediately. She was a lady, far above my status as a farmer's boy. She warned me to leave because being seen together could bring trouble, but she showed fondness toward me. We talked until a shout alarmed us. Lorna pretended to sleep, and I hid as twelve menacing men came searching for her. The biggest man among them, with a long black beard, found Lorna and called her their little queen. He kissed her forcefully and carried her away on his shoulders. Despite the frightening sight, Lorna secretly signaled goodbye to me. I struggled to leave the valley and reached home much later, angering my mother by refusing to reveal where I'd been. After that adventure, I often thought about the girl from Dune Valley but never expected to return. I focused on farm work and eventually stopped dwelling on her. As time passed, I grew taller and stronger, surpassing any man in Exmoor. My sister Annie grew more beautiful,
capturing the attention of our cousin, Tom Fagas. He was once a famous robber, known for targeting the wealthy without harming anyone, which made him popular among the people. When I was younger, Tom Fagas, the former robber, often visited our farm. Despite my mother's initial concerns, she eventually welcomed him, recognizing that he wasn't as bad as others. Annie seemed kind to him, and Lizzie, despite her unpredictability, was herself. My mother remained kind-hearted but never forgot my father, sometimes crying for him over the years. Thoughts of Lorna Doon became a distant memory as the Doons continued their lawless activities. At 21, Uncle Ben was robbed by the Doons while on his way to visit us. Furious, he asked for my help to find their hideout, seeking revenge. Taking him to the mountains overlooking Dune Valley, memories of the girl I met there resurfaced. Looking down at the valley, Uncle Ben suggested attacking with guns from the cliffs. However, my attention shifted to a figure in white near the waterfall, a figure that made my heart race after seven years. I had almost forgotten about Lorna, assuming she wouldn't remember me either. But suddenly, everything became clear, my future was tied to her. I decided to return to Dune Valley on St. Valentine's Day, the same day I first entered the valley years ago. Climbing the waterfall again wasn't easy, even though I was older. As I gazed at the beautiful valley in the spring sunshine, I heard someone singing. It was Lorna. Her beauty both captivated and scared me. Unsure of how to approach her, I initially hid behind a rock. But then, I stepped out, calling her name. At first, she seemed ready to run away but when I reminded her who I was, a smile lit up her face. I'm John Ridd, the boy who brought you fish seven years ago, I said. She remembered me hiding behind the rocks and how kind I had been. She recalled the moment I left on a man's shoulders, pretending not to know her. She remembered our encounter, even recalling how I waved when leaving. However, she reminded me of the dangers, her eyes showing both fear and kindness. I felt an intense, inexplicable love for her, unable to express what I felt. She was scared someone might hurt me if they saw me there. Feeling afraid myself, I promised to return with fresh eggs from our farm. Though she warned me again, she smiled kindly as I left. In the following days, I couldn't stop thinking about Lorna, doing my farm work in a daze. When I visited her again, she hurriedly guided me to a hidden room in the mountain rocks, away from the guards. I gave her the eggs, and she began crying. I asked what I'd done wrong, but she assured me it wasn't my fault. She said it was just her sadness seeing anything from the outside world, as she wasn't used to kindness. I wanted to comfort her, but I listened instead, and it seemed to make her like me more. She shared her life story, leaving out her feelings for John Ridd. She mentioned only two people who listened to her or tried to help, her grandfather, Sir Enser Dune, who seemed strict but caring toward her, and her uncle, known as the Counselor, who talked about what's right but never acted on it. Her aunt Sabina, a good person, had taught her a lot before passing away, leaving a void like losing a mother. She dreamt of a peaceful world outside the valley but felt surrounded by violence and robbery. Her father, described as the bravest and best, was a mystery to her. Feeling lonely and confined, she valued our secret meetings, as only her grandfather, the counselor, and sometimes Carver knew of the place. Carver, though strong, was violent and eager to marry her, a thought she dreaded. She felt trapped but couldn't leave due to her grandfather's feelings. 
Lorna couldn't speak any more and broke down in tears. I comforted her until she worried about my safety, making me promise not to return for another month. After agreeing with Lorna that she'd signal me with a dark coat on a white rock if in danger, circumstances changed. I received a letter from a royal servant, Jeremy Stickles, calling me to London to speak about matters concerning the king. My mother fretted, but Mr. Stickles assured her it was because of my reputation for strength and goodness. Before the agreed month was over, I had to leave for London. I searched for Lorna in the valley but found no sign. It was a tough journey due to road robbers. In London, delays meant waiting for over two months. The city was dirty and bustling, a far cry from Exmoor. Mr. Stickles was good company, sharing amusing stories. However, London's political tensions between the king and the city were prominent, and the judges weren't ready to see me promptly. Nobody had time to talk to me. At last, I was called to see Judge Jeffries. Jeremy Stickles had told me about Judge Jeffries, the king's chief judge known for his terrible temper. He had sentenced many of the king's enemies to death. In the room I entered, three men were sitting on high seats, all dressed in fancy clothes. The man in the middle, Judge Jeffries, seemed the most important. He had a fierce look in his eyes. He asked me who I was and where I came from. After I answered without fear, he asked about the robbers in Exmoor. I told him about the Dunes, a group of around forty strong thieves. The judge said he'd handle them and warned me to stay out of trouble, away from the king's enemies, and the dunes. He considered using me as a spy but decided I seemed too honest for that. I didn't have money for the journey home, so I had to walk for seven days back to Exmoor. When I arrived, my mother hugged me and cried. I gave presents I got from London to everyone but I couldn't tell my mother about Lorna because of my father's murder by the dunes. I felt Lorna wouldn't love me because of these circumstances. I worried about telling my mom, but I hurried to Dune Valley when I saw Lorna's sign, a coat on a white rock. I climbed around cliffs and waited for her. She seemed scared when I approached her slowly. She said she'd needed me long ago. I felt like things were over between us but when she saw I was hurt, she apologized. She led me to her secret place. It was partly open with plants. She looked sad and said Carver Dune and his father wanted her to marry Carver. They forced her to promise in front of her grandfather. She signaled for me, but her grandfather stopped them. They watch her now. I explained my journey and how worried I was. I showed her a ring I got from London. At first, she cried more, then she got close and I put the ring on her finger. She blushed, saying I surprised her. She didn't take it, saying it wasn't right yet. She liked me and asked me to stay safe. She kissed my head and returned the ring. The dune gate was scary, but I sneaked in quietly between the cliffs. I spotted guards arguing and used that distraction to slip by them. I headed towards Lorna's grandfather's house. I couldn't call out, but luckily, she appeared at a window. She was surprised to see me. She worried about why I risked coming there. Lorna explained she felt imprisoned by her ill grandfather, with the counselor and his son controlling the valley. She warned me to watch her house, as she couldn't send a message. I wanted to stay, but she insisted I leave for my safety. I promised to return once her grandfather passed away to take her to safety. Lorna agreed to come with me, and I put my ring on her finger. It was a tough decision, as she knew our love was facing many challenges. I went home to plan bringing Lorna to our farm. Mother wasn't happy at first but eventually understood. She agreed to teach Lorna to be a farmer's wife. We had a signal, if one of seven nests in a tree disappeared, 
it meant Lorna's grandfather was gone and she was in danger. That winter was harsh with deep snow. Remembering a book, I made snowshoes to walk safely. I used a sled to carry Lorna and her servant. When the signal came, I tied myself to the sled and set out for Dune Valley. I found a quicker way down the snowy mountain and slid to Sir Enser's house. Gwenny recognized me and let me in. Inside, I found Gwenny and Lorna, both looking terribly weak. Gwenny was starving, and Lorna appeared very ill. I'd been kept there until Lorna agreed to marry Carver. I knew we had to leave immediately. I asked Lorna and Gwenny to come with me through the snow. They agreed, and we quickly got ready. I heard noises outside, the dunes were celebrating Carver becoming their leader. This distraction would help us escape unnoticed. I carried Lorna through the snow, while Gwenny followed, stepping where I'd walked with snowshoes. We made it to the icy waterfall, and carefully, I maneuvered the sled down the steep slope, ensuring it didn't go too fast. I pulled the sled hard, knowing Lorna was weak. An hour later, we arrived home. My family helped bring Lorna inside, and we warmed her by the fire, giving her soup. She slept, and when she woke, her eyes held so much love. We sat quietly until my mother, tears of joy in her eyes, approached us. Lorna knelt beside her, and my mother placed her hand on Lorna's hair, overwhelmed with emotion. My mother spoke softly, calling Lorna her sweet child. A few days later, while sitting by the fire, Lorna wanted to give me something in return for the ring I'd given her. It was an old ring from her grandfather. It had a faint image on it, maybe a cat in a tree. I promised to wear it forever. As news spread that Lorna was at our farm, I knew the dunes would come looking for her soon, but the weather held them back. Spring brought heavy rains and flooded the dune valley, keeping them occupied with their own problems. Spring also brought Tom Faggies back to our farm. He showed us a letter from the king, filled with confusing legal words, declaring him not a criminal. This letter I got says the king is willing to forgive my years as a robber, so I'm free now. Tom explained that he spoke to Judge Jeffries, who knows him. Jeffries said, if you promise to stop robbing, the king will forget about you. Everyone was proud of Tom for being brave enough to talk to the judge. With some money he had left, Tom bought land and decided to be an honest farmer again. He asked mother if he could marry Annie, but she wasn't sure about this new farmer, Fagus. She feared he might get bored and return to robbing. Annie and I managed to convince her. As we prepared for the dunes attack, Jeremy Stickles, my old friend, arrived. He had been sent by Jeffries and the king to spy in Exmoor. Stickles asked if his soldiers could stay with us. We agreed, it would be helpful during a dune attack. One day, Lorna saw Carver Dune by our stream. She had gone to see some flowers and saw his cruel eyes. He couldn't cross the stream due to high water but fired a shot near her. Everyone was frightened. Lorna shared Carver's threat to come back and harm the farmer, John Ridd. Knowing the imminent danger, we prepared for an attack that very night. The dunes typically started fires in Herricks as a warning and display of power. As darkness fell, I positioned myself near one of the Herricks with a gun and a stick while ensuring Lorna stayed inside. Little Gwenny kept watch from a nearby tree, informing me of the approaching robbers. When she reported ten of them crossing the river, I instructed her to alert Mr. Stickles and his men while I stayed to monitor. When the dunes attacked, they initially aimed for the house, but Carver redirected them to set fire to the hayrick where I hid. His command was to kill everyone and burn the farm. Though I aimed my gun at Carver, I couldn't bring myself to shoot, opting for my stick instead. Two young dunes approached with burning sticks. 
As one ignited the hayrick, I struck him, causing him to fall in pain. When the other attacked, I disarmed him and subdued both, hesitant to confront Carver directly. However, a sudden burst of flames near the farmhouse signaled Stickles and his men firing at the dunes as they advanced, providing a timely diversion. Two of the dunes fell, and the rest ran away. This was the first time anyone fought the dunes as we did that night. It was my turn, I emerged from where I was hiding near the burning rick. I recognized Carver Dune even in the shadowy moonlight and grabbed him by the beard. Do you call yourself a man? I said. He was too surprised to react. No one had confronted him like this. When he tried to lift his gun, I was faster and knocked it away. I warned Carver Dune, telling him he wasn't superior but just an evil robber. I made him lie low in the dirt he came from and then knocked him down. When the others saw him fall, they ran, but Carver got up and left, shouting at everyone. Mr. Stickles advised against chasing them, it was too risky on the dark moor. The robbers faced defeat that night, something they hadn't experienced since they arrived on Exmoor. Two died, shot by the soldiers, and two were injured and sent to Taunton Prison. After the battle, Jeremy Stickles had something important to tell me. He explained he'd been gathering information for the king. He had news about Lorna. He hadn't shared it before, but now he thought I needed to know. He had been investigating and thought he discovered something significant about her. Jeremy Stickles began by warning me that what he had to say might not be easy to hear. I told him I was ready to listen, and he began his story. Six or seven months ago, before the snow started, he stopped at an inn on his way from Doverton to watch it. It was a quiet inn by the sea, and he was the only guest. The inn's owner, a dark and intelligent woman named Benita, sat down to talk with him during his meal. She shared her story of being from Italy and meeting an English family while working in Rome. This English family, who had a terrible argument in England over land with another family, asked Benita to travel with them and take care of their children, a girl, and a boy. Initially, everything went well as they traveled through northern Italy and into France. But tragedy struck on the French side of the Pyrenees when the husband of the family died in a riding accident. The wife, deeply saddened, eventually decided to return home to England. They traveled to watch it in the north of Somerset, warned about robbers along the roads. Despite the warnings, the lady traveled at night, a dangerous decision. They were attacked near the sea, the coachman drove onto the sand, followed by the robbers on horses. As the coach sank in the soft sand, a wave crashed against it, overturning it. Benita couldn't recall what happened next after hitting her head, but she woke up on the sand, and the robbers were gone. She searched for her mistress and found her sitting on a rock. A woman named Benita was with a family, traveling in a coach. The family had a sad past and was attacked by robbers. The lady in the family, who seemed to know the robbers, died that night in a town. Benita had no money and stayed in that place. She married a kind man nearby. The little girl from the family disappeared during the attack. Jeremy believed that girl was Lorna Dune. I had a feeling from the start that Lorna was that little girl. I remembered seeing the coach with the lady, the boy, and the girl. I also recalled the robbers on the day I found out about my father's death. The family's name was Lord Dougal, and Lorna's family, the House of Lorne, is very rich and famous. I had to tell Lorna what Jeremy said, but it made me sad. Lorna belonged to a high-class family, and I felt even more distant from her. 
Lorna and I sat in the garden. I told her about her family and how it might affect us. She cried for her parents but held no anger about what happened. Surprisingly, she embraced me and said she only wanted me, not her family's wealth or status. I worried about what would happen if the world discovered her true identity as Lady Lorna Dougal. As Tom and Annie's wedding approached, I rode to Dulverton. I thought about Jeremy's story, realizing the connection between Lorna's family and Sir Enser Dune's land dispute. It seemed the Dunes planned to marry Lorna off to regain their status. Sir Enser had protected her, hoping for a lawful marriage, but Carver had other plans. I saved money for our future wedding. In Dulverton, I stayed with Uncle Ben and his granddaughter Ruth. I didn't spend much, saving for my wedding to Lorna. We'd agreed not to touch her family's riches, intending to help the needy. But three days later, I returned home to find Lorna had been taken by lawyers sent by her uncle, Earl Brandier, against her will. She couldn't refuse as she was not yet twenty-one. She didn't even get to say goodbye to me. Upstairs near my bed, Lorna left a letter. She expressed her love and bid me farewell, affirming that we belong together. Though her words comforted me, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was the end. I pondered how the news of Lorna being alive might have reached the judges and her uncle. Maybe Jeremy Stickles had mentioned her in his reports or the Dunes informed London for revenge, thinking Lorna, from such a famous family, couldn't marry a simple farmer like me. Life on the farm felt empty, especially after Annie's marriage. I missed her companionship. We lived in fear of another Dune attack, especially now that the soldiers were gone. Jeremy brought news that the king wanted the robbers punished, but the country was in turmoil after King Charles II's death. I worried if this chaos would put Lorna in danger. There was no word from her since she left. Rumors said she was admired in London for her beauty. I feared she had forgotten about me amid the city's glamour. As fighting intensified in June between King James and rebels, I realized Jeremy wouldn't fight the dunes, the king needed his soldiers elsewhere. We grew anxious about what lay ahead. The dunes seemed focused on a new hope, joining the king's enemies, hoping to reclaim their old land. They sent most of their men to join the rebels, too busy to bother with us for a while. I decided not to get involved in the conflict, believing it wasn't my fight, though I sympathized with Annie's plea. Annie came to us, tearful, as Tom had left to join the rebels. I promised to bring him back, hoping to learn news of Lorna. Riding our fastest horse, I searched for days and finally reached the battlefield at Bridgewater. It was a grim sight, many dead and dying. I scoured the area, thinking Tom might be among them. Near an old farm building, I found Tom, badly wounded. He asked me to put him on his horse, knowing she could get him home safely. With soldiers still hunting rebels, I did what I could to help Tom, placed him on his horse, and set them on the way home. He whispered his gratitude and lay against the horse's neck to ease the pain. I was in a tricky situation, surrounded by soldiers who were convinced I was against the king. Despite explaining, they were determined to execute me. Cornered and helpless, I closed my eyes, resigned to fate, when Jeremy Stickles appeared and intervened, arguing with the captain to spare me. He convinced them to let him take me to London for trial. Grateful for Jeremy's intervention, I rode to London with him, but my movements were restricted. It took weeks before I could see Lorna. Eventually, Judge Jeffries believed my story and granted me freedom. But seeing Lorna was a mix of excitement and apprehension.
It had been a year without any contact. I wondered if she still cared for me despite her newfound status and wealth. Lady Lorna Dougal was a talk of the town, a symbol of beauty and wealth. But I only cared about her feelings for me. When I finally met her, she looked more beautiful than ever. Overwhelmed with emotion, we embraced, both expressing our love and confusion about the past year. Lorna wept in my arms, questioning my absence. I assured her of my love, unable to fathom anyone else holding her as dearly as I did. Lorna asked why I didn't kiss her, but instead, she suggested I do it. We stopped talking for five minutes. Then she asked why I hadn't noticed her for more than a year. I explained that she never wrote or sent any letters during that time. Lorna got upset and rang a bell. Her servant, Gwenny, came in, and Lorna asked about the letters she gave her. Gwenny said she didn't send them, believing Lorna should marry a wealthy lord, not a farmer like me. Lorna got angry at Gwenny and sent her away for three days. She explained that Gwenny cared for her, but she'd have to come along if I took her. We discussed our future, and I told Lorna she might face criticism if she chose a farmer's life. Even though our farm offered comfort and care, it wasn't like being a grand lady with wealth. But Lorna was serious, saying she decided long ago that I must be her husband. She remembered the day I climbed a waterfall to get fish for my mother. Lorna realized she had learned that wealth and family names meant nothing compared to our love. She expressed how few people really cared for her beyond her wealth. She pleaded with me not to leave her, and I agreed to do whatever she wanted. Lorna gave me a sweet kiss, and I left Earl Brander's house feeling great. I visited Lorna daily in London, forgetting about my mom and farm work. But then, I received a letter from Lizzie, urging me to rush home. Lorna understood and bid me farewell. Lizzie's letter brought dreadful news, Jeremy Stickle's attack on Dune Valley had failed, and he got injured. This emboldened the Dunes, who started terrorizing Exmoor, robbing and causing fear. Then a horrifying incident occurred. The Dunes kidnapped Marjorie, the wife of a neighbor, and fatally harmed their little son, leading to anger and a desire for revenge among the people. Exmoor's folks approached me, seeking leadership against the Dunes. Despite feeling inadequate, they insisted I lead them. Eventually, I agreed, considering our chance due to the reduced number of dunes after various conflicts. We devised a plan, spreading a rumor about a gold-filled cave to lure the dunes while we laid a trap in the caves and attacked their valley. Tom Fagas suggested a strategic move, emphasizing that fighting the dunes directly wouldn't work. Instead, we'd use a story about a new gold-filled cave to bait them, preparing to ambush them in the caves while others attacked their valley. This was our plan to stand against the Dune's tyranny. Tom led a pretend attack on the Dune Gate while we stealthily approached from the waterfall, a path I'd known for long. The gold story worked, and our spies confirmed the robbers' departure to the caves. As the moon rose, my men and I headed toward the valley while John Fry, stationed in the mountains, would signal the start of the fighting. John's gun signaled us to action. We climbed the waterfall and entered the valley quietly. Meanwhile, Tom's men caused a ruckus at the gate, drawing the dunes there. We set the dune town ablaze, ensuring no harm to women and children. When the Dune men returned, we were hidden, outnumbering them twelve to one. Initially, I thought of taking them as prisoners, but my men sought revenge for the years of torment. The battle turned into a fierce fight, guns emptying into a hand-to-hand -hand combat. I sought Carver, but instead, 
I saw a familiar figure, the counselor, crawling in the grass. He pleaded for mercy, revealing that Carver killed my father. Reluctantly, I agreed to let him go, and he confessed the painful truth, it was his son, Carver. I suspected the counselor but couldn't blame him, as he wasn't present. He was a deceitful man, and though I had the chance to stop him, I let him go. Later, I learned Carver escaped our trap, leading the dunes away from danger. Despite our victory, Carver's survival didn't bring peace. Lorna returned, her joy palpable. Her freedom to choose, including marrying me, brought immense happiness. However, beneath her excitement lingered a deep fear that haunted both of us. Despite the celebrations and wedding plans, an ominous feeling lingered. Our wedding day brought an air of excitement across Exmer. But tragedy struck. As we exchanged vows in the church, a shot rang out, ending Lorna's life. Holding her as she passed away, I vowed revenge. I knew who was responsible, only one man could commit such an evil act. Mounted on my horse, I pursued Carver, ready to confront him. As he galloped into a valley, I followed, knowing he had nowhere to run, only a bottomless bog awaited him. Our confrontation was inevitable. As I pursued Carver, I grabbed a branch from a tree, then he abruptly halted at the sight of the bog. He fired at me, but I ignored the pain, striking his horse and sending them crashing down. As Carver stood, I struck him and we engaged in a fierce struggle. Eventually, I overpowered him, but as he lay defeated, the bog pulled him in. I somehow made it back home, nearly delirious from blood loss. Mother and John Fry took care of me. Meanwhile, Ruth had saved Lorna's life after she was shot at the church. Despite everyone's belief that Lorna would die, Ruth's care helped her slowly recover. During my fever, I was convinced Lorna was dead and found no purpose in life. However, Ruth revealed Lorna's survival to me, bringing her to my room. Lorna rushed into my arms, even though I was weak. Her presence rejuvenated me, restoring the joy of living and loving. As we recovered, Lorna and I found solace in each other's presence. We now live peacefully on the farm, using Lorna's riches to help our neighbors. Tom and Annie are content, Lizzie married a soldier, and Ruth's love life seems promising. But Lorna remains the dearest part of my life, her beauty and kindness growing with each passing year. She's still my beloved Lorna Dune.